Born Again Christianity and the Moral Politics of AIDS in Uganda. And she's the co-author of Legislating Gender and Sexuality in Africa, Human Rights Society and the State. Uh, so Lydia, thank you for um, facilitating this discussion today and I'll hand things over to you. Thanks oh, and so actually, much. Yeah. I'm sorry, one more thing uh, that I forgot to say, um, a little bit about etiquette for our event today. We will be recording the event. Um, and I also want to ask everyone to please keep their, um, keep themselves muted um, during the discussion. So without further ado, Lydia Boyd. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Peter Weiswa, who is an associate professor in the Department of Health Policy Planning and Management in the School of Public Health at Macquarie University in Uganda. He also has a joint appointment at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Professor Weisfeld received his medical degree from Berari University of Science and Technology in Uganda, his MPH from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and his PhD in health systems through a joint program at Makere and the Karolinska Institute. His research focus is on newborn health and the development of maternal newborn health interventions. Uh, he's the director of the Maternal and Newborn Health Working Group at the In-Depth Network, which is a global network of health and demographic surveillance systems. And at McCarray, he is the director of the Maternal and Newborn Center of Excellence Research Group. He is an international expert on the topic of neonatal illness and death in Africa. And his research has been supported by numerous funding agencies, including the Gates Foundation, the European Union, PEPFAR, and UNICEF. He's published widely on the topic of newborn health, including on issues relating to tracking the drivers of health complications, understanding health behavior, issues relating to the improvement of care at the community level and global and national health policy. Today, we're very happy to have Dr. Weiswa talk a little bit about research partnerships and the strategies for successful collaboration. Most of the projects that Dr. Weiswa works on are large collaborative efforts um, that involve lots of different kinds of researchers and different sources of funding um, and that bridge um, partnerships between Africans and um, researchers outside of Africa. Today, his talk is entitled Strategies for Building Effective Partnerships in Africa, Incentives, Challenges, and Risks. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Weiswell, who's going to speak for about 30 minutes or so. And during that time, you can feel free to post a question to chat. I'll be moderating the, the questions after his talk. So I'll keep it, uh, an eye on the chat. And then after he finishes speaking, we'll also, you can also ask questions um, live. Um, so with that, thank you very much, um, Dr. Weisbo, for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues, for introducing me and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I uh, put my um, addresses here in, in case anybody wants to contact me, and I put these two buildings, uh, one for McKay on the left and on the right for Karolinska Institute, because I work in both institutions. Now, I started asking by saying, whose agenda is it? And I hope uh, many of you reflect on this as we talk uh, partnerships. This is going to be the outline of my presentation. I'll, talk, I'll give some objectives of my lecture today, talk about research capacity in Africa, some of the benefits and challenges and risks and examples of success and my parting uh, words on on this topic. Now, I, I want to discuss based on my experiences. So a lot of it is not really academic, it's based on my experiences uh, around this area where I'm quite involved in many partnerships uh, in Uganda and around the world, which I don't know how many. And um, I have interpreted um, at the top today as uh, uh, being uh, between the partnership with Africa and Western institutions, especially universities. Uh, so that is what I'll be talking about uh, mostly. And um, um, my home institution and country is Uganda. And in Uganda, we have this famous building, which is uh, our administrative building of Makere. We call it the Ivory Tower. Makere is seven years, always ranked among the top five in Africa and only mainly South African universities and sometimes uh, Egypt uh, beat us, but uh, uh, we are saying that we're in line to become the top university in Africa. But unfortunately, last week, 
uh, this important building burnt. <laughs> and um, this is uh, affecting us so much, our reputation, our credibility, our motivation, because it is the administrative building uh, built in the 1940s during the colonial times. Makay will be making 100 years later this year, so and next year. So it is so bad that uh, our iconic building burns. But also it explains to some of the issues we have in African institutions, issues of systems. We might be reputable, but uh, a lot of uh, this uh, reputation is because of efforts of individuals and systems are weak. When the building burnt in the night, uh, there was no water at the university, there were no, in the, there were no hydrants at the university, and it was very difficult to put out the fire. But the building will be uh, rebuilt a lot, but unfortunately a lot of information was lost. We lost part of our history in this fire. Now, I wanted to give some caveat about myself that I'm no expert in the partnerships. I have just experienced them. Um, um, uh, most of my experience is here in Africa where I'm born, live and practice. My work focuses, as said, mostly on mothers, newborn children and health systems uh, in Africa, although I've also worked uh, because of collaboration work in the South, South Asia. And uh, most of my areas of research around mothers, newborns, child health and health systems. And for this, I've made quite, I think, significant contribution. And um, uh, not so long, I started actually working in a, a district. But in 2008, I joined a Macare, completed a PhD in 2010 in Kalinska and Mackay University. Kalinska is uh, the university which gives the Nobel Prize in medicine student. And um, for me, that, that is where the partnerships actually began. I started uh, building my uh, collaboration uh, through the joint degree. That was quite important. By the time I left, I was already actually collaborating with the professors and other colleagues and the, who are building partnerships. So uh, that was quite important. I also, as I said, I've started two centers for mothers, newborn, and children in Africa, um, one based in Makere and another one based in Ghana. And to do so, we actually helped by Save the Children in the US, but also informal, and the word informal, I should have underlined it, collaboration is with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, because there was a, a, a professor there who is quite involved with work in Uganda, and in Kalinska Institute, because I trained there. Uh, but also those were informal, but a lot of our partnerships have actually built on informal partnerships and the, uh, understanding each other and then working with the governments and the local governments. We do research, we do advocacy, we do dissemination, we do capacity building and they do lots of implementation research. In other words, we work in communities and we also do program engagement. That actually contributes to our value that government and communities perceive us as uh, making important uh, work other uh, than a lot of work which is often um, theoretical. But we need to understand the context for university university partnerships in Africa. And um, I've already given uh, about Makere on some of the issues. As you know, in the most of Africa, historically, this, it we used to be trained in economics that um, the um, sources of production, uh, land, labor, and capital, but increasingly, even in Africa, we are realizing that the scientific application of knowledge is more critical in economic development. And that gives a lot of power to universities uh, because knowledge is elastic. You can never finish it. You can never have it alone. You, and uh, it is transferable. So uh, that becomes important that how do we work with Western institutions like the US? In 20. Uh, 15, the UN through the Sustainable Development Goals realized the importance of science, of knowledge as important uh, in contributing to development. And the, it, that has been put at the center in all, almost all the Sustainable Development Goals. So we need science, we need knowledge to, to bend the curve because Africa's development is quite off. If you compare Africa to the West, the West is far ahead in terms of uh, development. And, and we need uh, mutual partnerships. 
uh, that are fair, that are transparent, that are based on a global solidarity. Because really, uh, I think we, are not, we can compete only in terms of the burden of disease and areas of research, but in terms of resources, money, we are, I think, not so competitive. But if there is global solidarity, then I think we'll have a focus. So need to have effective knowledge use, uh, use of skills, and also technological transfer. This is an important part in partnerships. I'll give you an example in the areas I work on. So a couple of years ago, we published a paper in The Lancet as a group of global authors, including some people in the US, uh, to uh, focus more on uh, mothers, newborn and children, but this was on newborn. And we were looking at the sustainable development goals, looking at where is Africa and uh, where will Africa be in 2030. And we saw that uh, Africa, uh, unless we do a lot, and that is quite an important message, it will take about a um, hundred years for African uh, countries to have neonatal mortality uh, at the level at which it is like in the US, like around three, three per thousand. It will take over a hundred years if we go at the current rate. Therefore, we say we need no new knowledge, we need skills, we need more capacity to bend the curve so that we get off this bad trajectory, which is taking us to almost 100 years when we're almost all dead, if Africa is to get to the level where countries are. And the technology and the science is there. Uh, it is there in the West. Uh, how can this be transferred to Africa? So there is a clear role for knowledge, for science, for technology in Africa. But would we have the experts uh, and the we see that we have this, what we call the inverse care law, and I could say inverse knowledge law, inverse resource law, that it, these areas which have the greatest burden also have the least resources, the least expertise. And uh, unless there is a, um, a collaboration um, between the West and Asia, I think it is unlikely that we'll, we'll be able to move. But are these partnerships effective? Uh, we need effective uh, partnerships. But look here, uh, in terms of science, uh, which is uh, knowledge, Africa publishes almost just say, more than 1% of um, uh, the, knowledge, the global knowledge production. So we are quite off. How can we build more capacity and can partnerships make a, a contribution? Um, to pattern effectively, several things are uh, uh, important. Uh, I think for, you, for people in the West, they need to understand the African scientist, African academic. We, we are not just in academic institutions. We, we spend our time doing much more. Right now I'm in, actually in the field because uh, I'm, I'm making a contribution to COVID. Uh, we are teachers in universities, but also we are teachers in communities. We are teachers in universities, but also we are meant to be innovators. We are meant to be providing services so, uh, to communities, but also we are leaders because many times we are doing a few who are educated. And also um, sometimes we have all these extended families that we have support and a lot of community norms. One of the communists which Lydia knows quite well is barriers in Africa. So you stop everything in the university because someone has died and will be by the next day. We don't have systems for reserving bodies. And we really have one job in order to make ends meet. Many times we're also uh, working as farmers, as business people, in order to make ends. That makes it very difficult sometimes to do these partnerships. Here I give a picture of myself here in the center where I was in the community and uh, trying to implement work and then met a group of children who are coming uh, interested. But this is an example that we are not just in uh, the universities, but also spending a lot of time in the communities. So what are some of these challenges for African sciences? We have low access to knowledge publications. So if you see in this slide, uh, who are the Lancet? The Lancet is the leading medical, one of the leading medical journals in the world. And um, uh, if you look at the readers, most of them are in the US and the UK. And here we only see uh, South Africa in Africa, almost representing 1% of the readers. 
Africans are not accessing these journals or are not reading enough. That is one of the challenges with partnerships. Yesterday, uh, I think a few days ago, there was an editorial by one of my colleagues from Uganda in the BMJ uh, saying that uh, uh, journals should stop charging money because they are limiting our access to knowledge. Then when you look at countries of first authorship in this Lancet, there is no Africa at all. It disappears completely. So the Africans, they may be contributing the science as the research is done here. I mean, most of the work on HIV has been done in Uganda and other countries. But the authors are not necessarily Ugandans. Uh, there are people sitting uh, mostly in the US and elsewhere. So that's a challenge of access to knowledge. Many times we also externally fund it. In fact, almost all the time. That's a big problem with partnerships, which create a one way. Um, if you look at, for instance, my school, McKay University School of Public Health, we have improved a lot in terms of money, moving from a million dollars to almost 35 to 40 million dollars a year uh, at the school, which is quite important. We have over 100 projects, but the commonest funder for this are not the government of Uganda, it's not the private sector in Uganda. Our communist fund actually US government, USID, NIH, the Gates Foundation, other US institutions through universities and foundations, European governments and institutions, and also global bodies. So this is a problem that funding is uh, from outside, and therefore we set in the agenda if funding is not from here. Then problems, there are so many problems with this external funding. Who is setting the agenda? The context, is it, do they understand the context? You know, somebody gives uh, a criteria for research and doing it from, maybe from NIH or somewhere, but do they understand the context here? Like right now on COVID, the setting is different. How about follow-up um, of initiatives? We do many effective trials, but then how do you follow up this work to get into a policy? when the funding has been abroad. Many times the funding ends with the study. How do you sustain? And um, uh, about people who do basic research in terms of startup, I have a colleague of mine who developed an Ebola test and um, uh, had been given money by the Canadian government. And they gave a, a condition that if he's successful by developing that test, they give him a million dollars if somebody can match it. So when the government of Uganda asking, can you match this? It took the government two years to get back to him after he wrote an article in the newspaper. Why is the president not, you have to speak to the president, not attending to me. And the president's office came back saying, oh, sorry, we don't have money. Uh, so you, you have an innovation, but you cannot take it to, like, uh, to the market. Many of them have no capacity building, many of the projects, and, the, and actually the understanding of capacity building is limited. Uh, based on uh, their context, but not ours. And the, uh, we train as PhDs and more, but we rarely have the time to just focus on the areas we did our PhD because we are struggling to, you know, make and submit. Many times you cannot make it through academia. So we have this power imbalance with the global partners, and this is a, a major problem. Uh, many of the funding, we, a lot of the funding we have is through Western institutions, uh, especially universities, and the uh, direct funding to African universities where, from these global institutions. Uh, often very limited flexibility, uh, so much control, and so and the, there is often limited trust in the, the Africa. Many people think maybe we are not credible, we don't have the capacity. So it becomes problematic sometimes collaborating. I'll give you an example about a project we had funded by a US, a US partners through a US university. It was $25 million done in three countries in Africa. But we received about a quarter of that money, yet the work was here. Most of the other money was used in the US. So, and we understand, of course, the US universities um, have a very high overheads and, um, and stuff like that. But of course, it becomes problematic in terms of uh, collaboration. So, um, so uh, many times uh, the researchers sometimes, it is beginning to change incidentally, which is good, but previously many researchers would just fly in, do work and go. African scientists uh, or researchers would be data collectors. And um, um, in fact, 
have this project we are doing, and immediately you come in an area there is network, the data disappears from your gadget, uh, and it goes into the cloud, and you are not able to access the data. Even to use it, you need permission to run back to the US or Europe for, to, to be able to use the data. Uh, so those kind of things are beginning to change, but they've been here. Africans somewhere, in terms of authorship, they are really first authors, and uh, somewhere you, you are in the middle. Of course, we need to do more, to write more, and it's beginning to change. And also, uh, for me, I have this problem. Uh, in academia, we have to travel, but global mobility is a problem. To get a visa to the US or to Europe is a nightmare. You spend days, months, bring land title, bring wedding certificate, bring what? You know that this is for me an important issue that global health needs to address. That how can we make academics be trusted and travel more in order to access and share uh, global knowledge? So actually, some time back, I wrote an editorial in the uh, International Journal of Public Health, uh, and I said a global uh, productive uh, health research for Africa it takes a lot. And in that editorial, I talk about these hassles that uh, we go through and uh, trying to call uh, the, the world to try to attend to some of these issues. All we got is some tweets. We don't know how to follow up on these issues. Of course, the interface between uh, global health and um, uh, like uh, uh, ministries of, um, of uh, foreign affairs is so limited. We have a lot of brain drain internally from academia, but also externally, uh, which is some of the problems that we face. But we have some strengths as African uh, researchers and uh, ac academics. Many of us have been trained in some of the best institutions in Europe, in the US, and in Africa. So uh, we have the expertise, we have the knowledge. We do have so many opportunities for research. And um, uh, in terms of here, we have the vectors, we have poverty, we have diseases, we have patients, we have communities that are so uh, receptive. That is an opportunity. There are a lot of partnerships actually beginning to emerge, but most of these partnerships are not really uh, like strong, they are disorganized. There is increasing recognition of uh, many African academics locally and the internationally. And uh, uh, in, with time, Africa is actually beginning to build these hubs for research that are emerging all over the continent. So, so recently, I was uh, in March, I was at um, UCSF, and we have a new project, and we started discussing about collaboration, how can it, and partnerships, how can it be better? And these are some of the things that came out. One was, uh, what are some of the benefits, the incentives on both, for both parties? There is sharing of experiences. Um, um, there is, uh, um, couch, there is uh, cultural competence, access to resources, money, more productivity in terms of publications, but also more relevant work. And also you develop networks, you pull knowledge, you develop global expertise, and uh, you impact lives. This is quite motivating. Uh, doing work here makes a difference and you build capacity. And some of the principles that we discussed that day were that um, we need the principles for these partnerships. We need to be open to criticism both ways, even uh, for us here, <laughs> and, but also to those we collaborate with. We need to build trust. We need to have mutual respect, be transparent in terms of resources, in terms of interests. We need to have commitment for both parties and to be honest, to be fair, to be equitable and to create a long lasting relationship and if possible, institutionalize. This is quite important that uh, if, uh, of course, if it's possible, uh, creating long, long uh, lasting relationships is quite important in uh, this partnership. But there are some risks to partnerships in, with African institutions. One, because of financing, most of it is from the West, we are so dependent. And that is not very good for us. Um, then uh, in terms of um, uh, many institutions also, there's corruption and lack of accountability. That's a big problem that is in our institutions. Uh, many centers of excellence are addressing this, but 
these things are there and some people fear for them. There is a lot of bureaucracy. There is um, um, sometimes the work that uh, is initiated from somewhere it may not be so relevant, but you know, because somebody wants money, you just accept it. Sometimes there's data loss. I told you about the university burning because we don't have good systems. Ensuring data quality can be a challenge. I mean, you need the internet, you need well trained people, you need to supervise them. Uh, a lot of the time, there's lack of institutionalization. Many of these partnerships are individualized. And that's also a major, major challenge. In my case, this is a very big problem that uh, a lot of the collaborations are at individual level. And uh, this doesn't build, system doesn't build uh, institutions. We lack systems, people are too busy. Uh, they do so much, no limit. Whereas in the US, you cannot have more than 100% income. Here, uh, there is many times no limit and people go on, go on, and they become too busy even to be uh, effectively productive. Then in some areas we have limited expertise and we don't have sometimes effective infrastructure. And as I say, sometimes the research may not be relevant. But I wanted to give an example of a successful uh, institutional partnership that we've had in Makere. This is uh, considered one of the most relevant um, uh, collaboration that we have. It is between the Swedish International Development Agency or Government of Sweden and actually Makere University. And it started back in 2000 when the Swedes said, you know, to develop academic capacity is so important for development. And we are going to have a partnership between our uh, support Makere to produce uh, high level trained people at the level of PhD and postdoc. Uh, the money was given to Makere, so it was Makere leading. And the, uh, Makere realized that they don't have the capacity to train PhDs at the time. So they said, okay, can we collaborate with Swedish universities? So Makere would receive the fund and lead the work and collaborate with Swedish universities. That is how I joined uh, later in 2008 and um, into this PhD training. And um, um, the research agenda was developed in Uganda and the, the Swedish universities across the different disciplines joined. Uh, from 2000 to now, over 210 PhDs were trained in Makere, so many masters, in fact right now more PhDs because um, uh, this funding has been increased and a lot of postdoctoral fellows. Now this partnership also extends to the medical school and the College of Sciences, where again so many PhDs, over 500, 500 peer-reviewed publications, most of them led by the PhD students we are Ugandan. So we learned how to write science, which has been good for us as individuals, but also as, um, um, uh, as Makere. We set the agenda based on local health system challenges, and then, which are important to government. So the government also had a buy-in, and finally the government didn't put money in it, which is still one of those challenges. Then most of the graduates have remained in Uganda and continuing to do global collaboration. But even Swedes collaborated. The Swedes came here to do their PhDs, their postdoc. And one of my best friends, who was my supervisor, became the chief of health at UNICEF. He always says, well, it is that collaboration in Uganda that helped me to get this global job. So uh, because of the success, SIDA uh, gave us more money about four years ago to continue this partnership. But for Makere, because our capacity had been built to now train other universities. So like uh, the initial recipient of funding are give, now giving support to other Ugandan universities with a bit of Swedish collaboration. And the model, we analyzed this and wrote this in the paper, uh, how this joint partnership worked. It focused on uh, the individual in terms of PhD student uh, or postdoc, but also it uh, focused on building the capacity of the supervisor, uh, that, that is the, the lecturers, and, and by working with the Swedish lecturers, but also developing networks and translating a lot of this information to policy and then locally and globally. So this mode of capacity building has been very much appreciated by uh, the university and by Uganda, whereby it is mutual and uh, it uh, actually empowers Ugandans to lead. Um, and the, um, uh, one of the things they, they try to do, they build capacity across the board, not just the individual, they also worked in labs, 
in the internet, in the management systems, it is uh, that we are weak in the university. So as uh, I get to the end, I ask the question, how can we uh, have partners work better? Based on my experience and uh, some of this work, what are some of my parting takeaways um, about uh, effective partnerships between uh, academic institutions in the West and here? One is clarity and uh, of um, the focus of the partnership, quite important. Then commitment of both parties. It is important that we, uh, we discuss what can the university do? What can the individuals do? Even if they say they don't have resources. So the, the university has been committing uh, to ensure that uh, the students are available, they will get to leave, they will have time, um, and they, they will be committed. The issue of trust, um, so for me, uh, a lot of the partnerships eventually we become friends, not just researchers collaborating over business. That is quite important, and it makes communication easier. You email, you WhatsApp, it is easy because people have become your friends and um, you visit each other families and stuff like that. Those kind of partnerships tend to last longer. Um, and the, even today, uh, some of my partners in the UK were discussing, and when I couldn't receive uh, the internet, when I couldn't do it on, on the internet, they were WhatsApping me, Peter, where are you? Can we talk? A clear agenda becomes important. And maybe having a charter, even if informal, I mean, even if it's not committing in the university, it's important that say, this is how we have to collaborate. Where you can, and it's always in, uh, difficult, I mean, even in, in the US, having long-term financing is a problem. But uh, if it is possible to have long-term financing uh, or long-term research agenda and you apply for funding together, that is so important and uh, is the best. We need to be honest, we need to be transparent, we need to be open and to have regular communication and the review. That is quite important. So in many partnerships, uh, is there a regular review? Where are we? Are we all benefiting? Are there issues? Uh, the issue of mutual benefit, my Swedish friends and professors usually say, when they say thank you, when I say to them, thank you for your capacity building, they, always, they usually tell me back, Peter, it is reciprocal. We also benefit. So it is important to know that, you know, it is not just the small Ugandan or African country that is benefiting. I think all of us are benefiting. And the capacity building in the broader sense, not just of individuals. Now, this is a problem with a lot of the US model where people are pulled out of Africa, go to the university and come back. Actually, many of them get lost. They cannot get back to the institution because the capacity building is focusing on the individual but not how do you work with uh, your home institution. That is quite important. And uh, making effort to understand the context, um, I think so important. I told you about the context in which African researchers work, the country, the research institution, the resources, and the limitations. Having patience, this is quite important here. Uh, I mean, people uh, have issues, but um, uh, we need a little bit of patience. We time people differently improve because they get exposed to working in different uh, We need to be open to varying positions in authorship. We get concerned when every single article, you know, is led by even uh, an article which is not uh, that important, is led by authors from the West, or they are the last authors. I think those issues need to be discussed openly. Um, one of my professors usually say, Peter, I'm already a professor. I don't benefit anything from being a first author. So can you work more and become a first author? The issue of mentorship and support is critical in the grant writing, in the manuscript writing, but also you need to demand that people make efforts so that they are not just escorts, people benefiting from authorship when they have not made an input. So it's important to tell them that, oh, if you do nothing, you actually are not be part of this. Uh, we need to include support to younger scientists. Many of the collaborations are with senior people. It's important to know that these people are going to exit and the, uh, who is going to be there to take over uh, the work in the institution. And the, then this issue around mobility, which I talked about, and ultimately we need government support and the private sector funding. I think African institutions must rise up so that uh, we are not just uh, on the receiving end in terms of resources. I just wanted to leave these slides 
which show my work, our, our work in Uganda. The couple of my colleagues actually are from Uganda on uh, this uh, seminar uh, for our center of excellence on maternity board and also the in-depth work. And also leave you some pictures from some of the work that we've been uh, doing. Some of the work we work alone uh, here in Uganda. Uh, um, here we're developing a research agenda for newborn health in Uganda, uh, led by ourselves and uh, with the government. And here we are developing a research, a research area for the in-depth network. And uh, one of these guys, actually Joseph is now completing his PhD, I think a couple of guys, and very soon we shall be uh, publishing actually later this year, 10 papers in a supplement. With most of the papers actually led by people from Uganda, Africa, and Asia. And um, uh, uh, this is one of the review meetings that uh, we had. So I, I wanted to leave you with this picture that um, um, uh, I think these areas are emerging and um, partnerships are important. They need to be mature, I think, and uh, we need to plan them better to engage and uh, they are possible and they can be productive. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. There's a lot to think about. Um, I know I said that people could post questions in the chat. Over I realized... to you, Lydia. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I know chat is not working. So if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to use the reaction button, which is that little smiley face down at the bottom on the right side at the bottom. And you can raise your hand that way to ask a question. I can, I can start off uh, by asking you, you talked a lot about the structural limitations um, that create this sort of imbalance between um, partners that have access to the money to fund the research and then partnerships with African on the African side. One of the things that you talked a little bit about with, which I think is interesting, I, I, I see a bunch of my students are on this um, at this meeting and something that we've talked about in the class I'm, I'm teaching this semester, which is how the topics for research are chosen. Um, so issues of relevance. Um, could you give us an example of, of the kinds of patterns of topics that you see as being driven by sort of Western side agendas rather than topics that might be driven more by um, issues of relevance within Uganda, for instance? Are there examples that you could give us of, of, of that sort of like imbalance in terms of what gets funded, the t kinds of topics that get funded. Do you follow what I'm asking? Oh, you're, uh, let, me, let me unmute you. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I give you uh, from my own work, um, we have like a lot of babies dying. We have 5 million babies dying in the world. Uh, uh, in the, most of them are from Africa and then Asia. Uh, now, Western institution can come and say, oh, we want to work on uh, a certain drug for newborn, for, uh, let's say, a certain intervention, kangaroo mother care, um, and that is their area of interest. But uh, the, the, there is no newborn practice in this hospital. People want um, an integrated approach, <laughs> but they insist that, um, um, uh, well, our focus is on this and uh, the funders, of course, even uh, the funders and the, uh, also complicate the issue because some topics like integration are not um, uh, uh, usually getting financing um, and they, they want this small area which you can measure. Then two, they come and say, um, like we had this study which we just completed recently uh, from the Gates Foundation, initially Gates wanted to impact neonatal mortality at scale. <laughs> but when we worked with this university, they said, you know, we want a trial, another CT, because that is what sells to the scientists in that university. They could not accept a trial. I mean, an, just an implementation project, which is, is not uh, having randomization. So those kind of issues, the interest and the science uh, uh, in Western institutions and what they value as highest evidence, as opposed to the local needs, are some of those issues that um, sometimes are difficult and so many times it's very difficult to get a balance uh, on those kind of, of issues. Great, thanks. Let's see, Tiffany, Tiffany, you have your head up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? I really appreciate it. 
Um, so uh, I worked in Uganda for the last few years, um, and I'm now at this university um, working on my MPH in global health. Um, and one of the organizations that I worked alongside um, was TASO Uganda. I don't know if you've heard of them, um, but they yeah. are um, free access to HIV research publications um, to Ugandan populations. And I was wondering if um, you thought that a system like that might work um, on a larger scale, if other NGOs were to take that up and, and offer an, an open database to to the general public or to um, clinicians, if that might be something. Yeah, uh, no, this is quite important. I don't know, because of my Karolinska connection, so many students come to me. Peter, can you help us access this paper? I was reading yesterday paper and um, I wanted to read the paper yesterday and um, you know, it was asking me to pay uh, $100, like $50 in order for me to download the paper. Good enough, I have access to the Karolinska Library, so I was able to access it. But then most people wouldn't have been able to access uh, that uh, paper. Uh, I mean, who can pay $50 to access one paper? <laughs> you know, so I think it would be nice if um, this system, but um, on the other hand, uh, TASO is able to do it because of Global Fund HIV money. How about areas which are not uh, endowed with resources? What happens? <laughs> So I think we need to, de to democratize uh, science uh, access and uh, you know, make it fair and accessible. So um, uh, good enough, uh, there is uh, beginning to address some of these issues, but uh, we still have problems. Right, it would, I mean, it, would be, it seems to be like you could make it as simple as if you're accessing from an African IP address, the journal should be open access. It didn't seem like it would be that hard to do something like that, but there's not, a, there's not, there hasn't been a big enough push for that at the level of the publishers or to pressure the publishers to do that kind of, make those kinds of changes. Um, yeah. Carolyn? In terms of, yeah. uh, in terms of uh, a submission, it is usually uh, better because maybe it, right. it continues the business. <laughs> Right. That you, you know, we make the article available, then we sell it later. <laughs> but in terms of uh, uh, accessing now the published stuff, it is still a challenge. And even where yeah. it is made free through WHO, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you have to go through a lot of like uh, passwords in order to access this, uh, articles that have been made, um, systems that have been made free in Africa. Not like uh, just based on your location, you're able to, you know, Right. download it. If they could do that for the submission process, I think they should also be able to do it for the uh, access to the article. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Carolyn, do you have a question? Yeah, I think this has been touched on a little bit, but I would be curious to hear your thoughts on the breakdown of that, you know, pie chart you showed near the beginning about the lack of access for Africans to these publications and how you would think about this breaking down along lines of African researchers simply not having the physical or literal access to these documents and how much of these publications just aren't very relevant because they're focused in Western framing of questions and answers. Um, and how you would see like the expansion of that like for instance if african researchers had more access to these like would they increase their research on them or would they not be relevant enough for that to be a solution to the problem yeah so i i the, the like if you go the lancet uh interesting a lot of that cause uh about developing countries uh they might be hiv trials malaria trials vaccine trials um then there might be a policy paper um and um, written by somebody from uh, universal North carolina or Johns of kings or london school or harvard uh, but it's about africa and um, or relevant to Africa. Um, and, um, but uh, many times, of course, there will be one or two Africans so that there is an effort to uh, 
uh, can I say, democratize the, the publication, make it a little bit look, you know, um, like, yeah. So, but um, um, these papers, if you write a grant and you uh, review, I would say, you are not even uh, referring to the most important publication. And, and you know, importance is equal to, you know, the, the, the Lancet and the, the social sciences and medicine and stuff like that. But you've read, not read the work. So that's a, um, a big challenge. And the other thing which we have in, in terms of authorship, I was talking with the, the editor Lancet Global and they have tried so much. I, I know the, the editor of the Lancet and the editor Lancet Global and the other couple of editors we, we have met. But you know, <laughs> this is for me a challenge and um, I wish I had the power because um, um, they say that uh, the, the outcome you write to be published in the Lancet must be relevant to the global readership. But now, most of those, for an African to lead a global paper <laughs> is actually a big problem <laughs> uh, because um, you don't have the resources, the connection, the, uh, and I know how most of these articles, especially those of policy, how they get, I mean, we are writing a, a Lancet series coming later this year, but we even had to be in a retreat with the editor for a week. <laughs> so, so that, but which, which African can pull off this one? So that uh, even before the articles get there, you've negotiated the type of articles and uh, uh, how they even be. Uh, so those kind of things. So uh, for me, uh, those are the center of the world is still in uh, Washington, in New York, in uh, London and in Geneva. We need to see how uh, some of these places uh, become also, you know, centers of the world in, to be able, but uh, it's a big problem. I was leading a project. We wrote a paper between Africa and Asia. We had 32 sites. I was leading the work. My, my day, it was so impossible to communicate with these African and Asians. You meet them in a meeting, but afterwards you write a hundred emails to get a response. <laughs> and um, they change the job so much. So it is impossible almost to, um, do something that is of global level from, you know, uh, where we are sitting. So we have those limitations and that's why many Africans eventually move. I have colleagues in Kenya, but they register as Oxford, you know, Oxford University or London School because they have, in fact, there's one point I missed. These issues of joint appointments are going to be so important in the partnerships and, and so helpful in uh, moving the agenda for African scientists. For me, being part of Kaliska has helped me immensely. Are there other questions? You, you have to touch the little reactions icon in order to raise your hand. It looks like Sarah Torzon has a question. Sarah? Hi, um, thank you so much, Dr. Waiswa, for your presentation. I found it to be um, very informative and very helpful. Um, but I did have a question. Um, so you mentioned um, a little bit about creating um, fair partnerships and transparent partnerships. And I was just wondering for um, shorter term research projects and partnerships, how would you um, go about creating a research topic that's both relevant to, um, you know, both relevant to the Ugandan community as well as um, transparent and effective just being a short-term project. Yeah, <clears throat> so for example, today we're discussing uh, a project we want to do with the colleagues at uh, University College London. And um, we wrote um, something sometime which was not funny, but then uh, we, we've seen an opportunity to submit, to work to be done on early child development in Uganda. And um, so they were saying, oh, Peter, we don't need to change a lot in the protocol, we maybe the budget a bit. Um, and I said, no, I must review that uh, protocol and we make it relevant to the setting. We have COVID here uh, and it is affecting most of the communities. We cannot have the same protocol we did two years ago and, um, and, and use the same to submit, even if it was uh, highly uh, relevant. So I think those issues of consulting and uh, discussion and uh, asking, can you please, Peter, provide feedback? Good enough, these colleagues of mine said, yeah, Peter, you're going to be the main reviewer of the protocol. And therefore, there I'm able to bring local context. When we designed this project, we said we are going to base it 
at health facilities and let mothers and children come to health centers so that nurses work with them. I told them it doesn't work now. People fear to come to health centers. We have to meet them in the community and maybe even at home. So I think even for short-term projects, be consultative, uh, ask questions, um, ask for feedback and um, uh, accept feedback and then try to uh, agree on um, the methods that you use. Thank you so much. Great. Are there other questions? Are there a lot of, um, is there a lot of effort? Um, yeah, Emily, did you wanna? Yeah, I did have a question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have an applause emoji there. Um, Peter, it, it's, it's a little bit of a comment slash question. I was particularly struck by the point you were making that you believe US, um, US partnerships are more individually focused and not institutional, which is a model you've encountered more with European um, institutions. At, at UNC, we, we try, um, we have strategic partnerships, but, but I, am, I agree with you. I think that there aren't a lot of institutionally embedded incentives for partnership. And I wonder if you have any ideas about um, how to create different kinds of bureaucratic change that would, that would, support, um, that would support more institutional um, partnership? Is it a question of accrediting institutions, uh, having, you know, valuing that? Is it a question of um, how, you know, where do you see, where do you see those changes possibly happening? Why, why does it work so well with European institutions and perhaps not with American institutions? So the, the Europeans, um, it's actually mostly the, the Schengen countries, and uh, I mm -hmm. think it's because of their yep. system of democracy and um, yep. what they believe in and stuff like that. A lot of the financing is through government and the CEDA briefs, and most of them that the work should be led by the locals and stuff like that. And it is usually government to government. Uh, now for um, the, the, the US universities and institutions suffer from all these problems of the way you receive the, the financing, you know, uh, you are getting it for less than IH for one project. Although, having said that, we have a lot of institutional uh, partnerships in the, with US institutions, especially uh, and historically, I think that is how they emerge. It is HIV, it is uh, malaria, uh, and uh, most of those two areas. But because there were incentives, you know, um, like um, uh, it was attractive. I, I, if I can tell you one partnership where um, these professors at, at, Hopi, uh, at some university, their main role was to win the, the grants and the Ugandans create the infrastructure to, to do the trials. So uh, it was uh, like a sort of mochi, but also they were creating uh, those kind of um, um, vehicles to do their work. But when you come to some of these other areas, I think there are lots of limitation, even your end in terms of financing, um, you cannot be assured of long term you know, I, because most of these other areas apart from HIV, they are not well funded and uh, it's becoming much more worse. Um, so I think, and also, yeah, I think those are the main challenges. And um, uh, uh, so even for the US, the other thing which has helped is that the US government has been giving collateral money uh, in, uh, for researchers through CDC. <laughs> But um, uh, so that the universities sometimes they can have money for, re for, for research, but in terms of programs, maybe there's money through PEPFA or, or CDC. But uh, for these other programs, you know, there's no government money and that becomes uh, a major challenge. Then also, I think the African institutions have been part of the problem. If you count Make, um, one of the challenges we have is that the senior professors have benefited. I mean, they've been there for the last 40 years doing HIV research. And the, as beneficiaries, like they don't want even, they have created their own NGOs and their, um, research companies <laughs> in actual university, uh, you know, on, on university land and uh, stuff like that. But also they are the ones with the power, they can reach the president, they can reach the minister, they can reach uh, the managers of the university. So I think those kind of um, uh, incentives and lack of systems 
um, have created some of those challenges uh, for the African universities need to start taking uh, the lead. Sometimes I tell my dean is that, okay, we are competing for funding with you. As a dean, you shouldn't be competing so much for funding with us that maybe we need to, to see how we, um, you, you promote uh, work of others because you are in this position of overall leadership. Uh, it is beginning to change, but not as fast. So it will take also uh, effort on our side to make sure that institutionalization uh, happens. These incentives and disincentives are part of the problem because individuals uh, benefit a lot uh, from those collaborations. Yeah, great. I think it's sort of a chronic problem, right? Even if you're if you're looking at the research side, it's you can e more easily get money for these sort of like data collection or small investigations of narrow projects. It's harder to get money for implementation or scaling up of projects. And then on the institutional partnership side, it's very hard to get funding for things like, you know, uh, expanding a PhD program in Africa, like the partnership you have with Karolinska. It's, and, but that's very interesting. I mean, it's, that's really necessary. The kind of infrastructural investment is what, you know, solves some of these inequities and there's just not enough attention to that as an issue. All right, I think, it, does anyone have a last question? I wanna thank um, Dr. Weisswell so much for his time. Um, that was really informative and incredibly insightful. Um, and I think a lot of different people took away from this talk, um, something about these issues. Um, and I wanna just give a virtual hand clap. <laughs> <laughs> to him for his uh, for his talk. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Weisswen. Thank you, Lydia Boyd, for um, for um, for the vision and for the conversation. Thank you so much. All right, great. Well, we um, we did record the talk, and so we will have this available on the African Studies Center uh, YouTube channel so please um, please stay stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about the African Studies Center at UNC Chapel Hill please go to africa.unc.edu and we hope to see some of you in the future uh, virtually or eventually in person hopefully so thank you so much <laughs>